This channel is part of the History Hit Network. London. A busy, modern international capital with a rich 2,000-year history. At the heart of the city and its history is the Tower of London, one of the world's most famous tourist attractions. But within these stone walls lies another world, a dark past full of diabolical treachery and deadly ambition, a place of imprisonment, torture, and agonizing death. These stones echo with the weeping of prisoners, the cries of the condemned, and the tales they have to tell. Built by Norman conquerors, the Tower of London was the source of power over England. Across a thousand years, the fortress has been the home of kings and queens, a vault for their treasure and a prison for their foes. The battle over the tower and the control it symbolized claimed many victims. The greedy, the treacherous, and the innocent paid a heavy price in the struggle for power. The losers ended up in prison. For most, the only way out was execution. But there was something worse than death. The excruciating pain of torture. At the tower, torture was an art form taken to its highest level. Carefully written rules of torture were used. First, tell the victim the threat. Then show the implements. Prepare the victim slowly. Strip the victim. Give them a taste of physical discomfort. Then take them to the tools of the torturer. Then, finally, inflict unimaginable pain. The tools of the torture trade were sophisticated. In using the dreaded rack, victims' arms and legs were securely strapped to the device. As the ropes pulled tight, the muscles and joints were stretched and pulled to their breaking point. Torture was an everyday occurrence in the 16th century, a bloody era when religious wars shook England. Among the most accomplished practitioners in the art of torture was Bishop Edmund Bonner. Although he was a man of God, Bonner enjoyed inflicting pain. Bonner was an equal opportunity torturer. During the reign of Protestant Henry VIII, Bonner tormented Catholics. When Henry's Catholic daughter, Mary Tudor, came to power, Bonner switched sides and tortured Protestants. Because his victims felt he was doing Satan's work, he earned the nickname, the Devil's Dancing Bear. But Bonner was really doing the bidding of Queen Mary Tudor. When Mary succeeded her father, Henry VIII, she was a woman with an axe to grind. Henry VIII divorced Mary's mother, declaring Mary illegitimate and outlawed the Catholic Church. Queen Mary now had the power to get back at her father and take revenge. She reinstated Catholicism as the only religion of England. Subjects who didn't renounce their Protestant faith soon had reason to call her Bloody Mary. If Protestants refused to become Catholics, they would be tortured. If they still refused, they would be burnt at the stake as heretics. It was a medieval inquisition. And Bishop Bonner, the devil's dancing bear, was Bloody Mary's enforcer. Hiding behind religious vestments, the burly former lawyer fulfilled his dark purpose. When Mary appointed him Bishop of London in 1553, Bonner set up headquarters in the Tower of London and eagerly executed his work as heretic hunter. The Devil's Dancing Bear carried out the wishes of his royal mistress with a horrifying attention to detail. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. 
with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history just for you. With familiar faces such as Dan Jones and Dr. Eleanor Yanega, we've got hundreds of documentaries covering the greatest figures and events of medieval history. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. Queen Mary made sure Bonner had a steady supply of suspects for questioning. He held suspects in custody until they repented or were condemned. Bonner drew up a list of over a hundred questions about religious beliefs. If the accused didn't answer correctly, they faced the terrors of the torture chamber. Despite his relentless cruelty, Bonner insisted he only wanted to show people the error of their ways. Richard, I know thou hast no fault inside thyself, but hast been led astray by... Sometimes a small dose of torture was enough to persuade his prisoners. Just holding a victim's hand over a lighted candle until the flesh blistered off frequently resulted in a quick submission. Other times, more elaborate methods were required. There were red-hot irons and thumbscrews, bilbos to crush the ankles, and the brakes to snap off teeth. But the most popular instrument of torture was always the rack. Bonner's evil knew no bounds. He personally supervised every detail of every case, from the first examination to the horrible execution. Eventually, nearly everyone broke under Bonner's relentless torment. If they were shown to be enemies of the Catholic Church, they were condemned to burn at the stake. In his first two years in office, Bonner sentenced 89 men and women to be burned alive for their religious beliefs. By the beginning of 1555, there were probably no more than 200 active Protestants remaining in London. But this was 200 too many to satisfy the bloodthirsty queen. She scolded Bonner, sending him a letter complaining he was not working fast enough to root out heretics. Eager to please his employer, Bonner redoubled his efforts. He sent out spies and finally discovered a group of Protestants who were meeting in secret. Their deacon was almost immediately arrested. One of the parishioners, Cuthbert Simpson by name, consoled the gathering, but he was himself then arrested on charges of attending church services in English rather than Latin, a charge punishable by death. Simpson was taken to the tower to be tortured, but the Protestant deacon would prove to be a challenge for the sadistic devil's dancing bear. Simpson's diary describes what happened next. The following Thursday, I was commanded to give the names of those who came to the English service. I answered that I would declare nothing. In consequence of my refusal, I was set upon the rack. As the ropes pulled tight, the muscles and joints of Simpson's arms and legs were stretched and pulled to the breaking point. When Simpson fainted, he was revived. After three hours of torture, Simpson was unable to walk. He had to be carried back to his cell. The following week, Simpson was brought from his cell to face Bonner. Again, he refused to name those who'd worshipped with him. Bonner responded with characteristic cruelty. Simpson's forefingers were bound together. An arrow was put between them. The sharp arrow was driven through his fingers, and Simpson had to endure excruciating pain.
Relentlessly determined to break the religious man, Bonner forced Simpson into the rack twice more. Twice more, he refused to divulge the names of his congregation. By now, even the brutal Bonner admitted a grudging admiration for the strength of Simpson's convictions. Bonner later wrote, I affirm that if he were not a heretic, he is a man of the greatest patience that ever came before me. Thrice was he wrecked, and yet never have I seen him broken. Bonner admired Deacon Simpson's bravery, but mere strength of character alone wasn't enough to save Simpson from a grisly fate. So the sinner has one more chance to save him. Mighty soul, recant now, though it be too late to save the body. Save thy own mighty soul, recant now, never. Then God have mercy on me, burn him! Bonner had Simpson tied to the stake and burnt alive on March the 28th, 1558. Brave Cuthbert Simpson joined the long line of martyrs to the cause of religious tolerance. But the devil's dancing bear was nearing the end of his cruel career. Having burned, hanged, and tortured hundreds of innocent victims, Bishop Bonner, the devil's dancing bear, was soon to face his own moment of truth. When his benefactor, Queen Mary, died, her younger sister, Elizabeth I, became queen. Religious persecutions stopped. Elizabeth saw Bonner as a sadist and ordered him to resign as bishop. When he arrogantly refused, Bonner was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment in the tower. Now the once feared torture of the tower was a prisoner himself. He sat in the same dark cell where his victims had waited for their appointment with pain and death. For nine years, Bonner could contemplate the 450 people he tortured and killed in the name of God. Soon Bonner's time of reckoning came. Surrounded by squalor and filth, the devil's dancing bear died in 1569. In death, he joined his victims at a court far more just than his own. The Devil's Dancing Bear was only one of a long line of torturers, executioners, and murderers who stalked the halls in the Tower of London. For the best part of a thousand years, the walls of the tower have been stained with the blood of those who tried and failed to grab control of England. Of the 20 kings who first ruled from the Tower of London, six were murdered by their rivals for the crown, and two more died in battle. This was no surprise, for the tower's dark legacy began at its construction. Even as it was being built, its foundations were soaked in sweat, tears, and blood. The tower was a visible symbol of an era of slaughter. Victorious Normans launched a reign of terror to solidify their invasion of England. The construction of a massive fortress was a concrete sign of repression. When the Norman King William the Conqueror won the Battle of Hastings in 1066, he took control of London and the south of England. But keeping control was entirely another matter. William launched a series of vicious campaigns to crush rebellion and insurrection. Throughout the vanquished country, William built fortresses to oppress and dominate the population. And for his capital, William wanted the strongest castle of all, a building that would symbolize his power and terrorize his subjects. 
Needing an architect, William chose a man of God to build the forbidding fortress. Brother Gundolf was a monk and an architect considered without equal. All his work had been dedicated to the construction of churches and cathedrals, but the ambitious Gundolf dreamed of bigger and better religious buildings. William offered to make Gundolf a bishop with the chance to design a new cathedral. But there was one catch. Gundolf first had to design and build a fearsome fortress in the heart of London. Gundolf's ambition drove him to accept the offer. The man of God made a deal with the fearsome Norman conqueror. Despite his misgivings, Gundolf designed a masterful new fortress. Condensed into a single great tower, the castle would dominate London and guard the River Thames. A perfectionist, he insisted on the best materials. Protected on two sides by the old Roman wall and the river, the remaining two sides were enclosed by a water-filled moat. The great tower would be virtually unassailable. Finished in just three years, the tower has withstood centuries of turmoil and war. It protected the kingdom and was the center of one of the greatest empires in history. Despite Monk Gundolf's design to keep enemies from getting into the fortress, the tower couldn't keep its first prisoner from attempting to break out. In the year 1100, the Bishop of Durham was imprisoned in the newly finished Tower of London. The bishop, a tax collector, in addition to his religious duties, was a corrupt public official hated by Londoners. To placate the taxpayer, the king jailed the bishop on charges of extortion and bribery. A rich man, the bishop served easy time, even though he was closely guarded by Norman knights. The bishop was allowed to keep sacks of gold for expenses and have his servants bring in food and wine. Fond of food and drink, the heavy-set bishop hosted lavish dinners in the tower's banquet hall. They often turned into drunken revels. But the bishop tired of his gilded cage and plotted a cunning escape with the help of his servant. The bishop announced a special feast and ordered that casks of wine be delivered. Brought in under the nose of a jail guards, one of the wine casks had a length of rope hidden inside. The bishop invited the tower guards to the banquet. He made sure the guards had as much wine as they wanted, but the bishop remained strangely sober. He waited until the guards nodded off in drunken stupors. Grabbing his sacks of gold and retrieving the rope from the wine cask, the bishop made his way to the tower wall. Securing the rope, the bishop climbed over and started sliding down. The fat bishop had the added weight of his gold, and it looked as if the rope might break, but the rope held, and he continued his slide down towards freedom. Reaching to the end of the rope, the bishop discovered it wasn't long enough. He was left dangling above a dark abyss below. The helpless bishop was too fat and loaded down to make it back up the rope. The only choice was to let go. He held onto his sacks of gold and fell the rest of the way. He crashed to the ground without injury. Gathering up his coins, the bishop hustled to a boat and made it safely to the sanctuary of the French coast. The bishop became the first prisoner to escape from the fortress. The lucky few who escaped from the grasp of the tower were rare exceptions. Once inside the stone walls, most victims were trapped. Even an innocent teenage girl met tragedy in the tower. The girl was plucked from an ordinary life and within weeks found herself the Queen of England. But she was caught in a web of intrigue that turned into a nightmare. Jane Grey was just 15 years old when she was snatched from an idyllic childhood as a daughter of the aristocracy. She landed in a nightmare where everyone, even her parents, abandoned her. Trapped in a paranoid web of intrigue, Jane's nightmare was real. Her horrible journey included a nine-day reign as the Queen of England. Jane's cousin was 15-year-old King Edward. 
When he took to the throne in 1547, he was weak and sickly. Four years later, the child king was near death. Because of the king's youth and illness, a group of nobles known as the Royal Council ran the kingdom. And the council was run by the ambitious Duke of Northumberland. Northumberland's power was threatened because if the king died, the throne would revert to the king's eldest sister, Mary. Northumberland had to come up with a scheme so he could continue to rule. Northumberland hatched a risky plot. He would arrange a marriage between his own teenage son, Guilford, and the king's cousin, Jane Grey. Then Northumberland would persuade the dying king to name Jane as his heir. When Jane became queen, Northumberland's son would be crowned king. Northumberland would then rule the country. <laughs> Jane and Guildford knew nothing of their parents' scheme. The two teenagers who barely knew each other were told they were to become husband and wife. Jane's greedy social climbing parents jumped at the chance and eagerly agreed to the plot. The marriage was arranged. Ordered by her parents, Jane was trapped. She had to marry Guildford. On the morning of her wedding, guests remarked that she looked like a toy doll, even younger than her years. But the omens for Jane's marriage were not good. Thunder and rain marred the hastily forced wedding. Despite the speed of the engagement and marriage, the bewildered Jane was determined to make the best of it. After the wedding ceremony, the couple suddenly found themselves alone, locked together in a world not of their making. Jane was determined to do her duty and fulfill her role as a wife to Guildford. That night, the couple slept the sleep of the innocent, blissfully unaware of the nightmare that lay ahead. For the first few weeks of their forced marriage, the teenagers got to know each other. Jane tried hard to love the handsome young stranger who was now suddenly sharing her bed. But less than six weeks after the wedding, Jane received startling news. A lady-in-waiting came to her bedchamber with the news that her cousin, the boy King Edward, was severely ill. She was to go at once to her father-in-law Northumberland's estate. At Northumberland's palace, the young couple were met by a disturbing scene. As Jane wrote in her diary, Everyone began making complimentary speeches and bending their knee, which made me blush. My distress increased when my parents paid homage to me. Finally, Jane's father-in-law, Northumberland, told her the king was dead. For the first time, the shocked Jane was told she was to become Queen of England. I fell to the ground, weeping piteously for the death of the king, and cried out, the crown is not my right, and pleaseth me not. Telling her it was for the good of England, Jane's scheming parents convinced her to assume the throne. Later she wrote, I should not have accepted it. It showed a lack of prudence. The next day, Jane was taken to the tower where she was proclaimed queen. The crown was brought to her, but Jane insisted she had not asked to see it. It was explained that the crown was going to be adjusted to fit her head. Then Jane discovered a king's crown was being fitted for her husband, Guildford. Suddenly, the entire ugly plot became clear. She was not to be the real heir to the throne. Her scheming father-in-law, Northumberland, was using her to have his son, Guildford, become king. They were pawns in the struggle for power. Jane was furious. She told the councillors they had betrayed her. She couldn't trust her parents, she was alone. 
I told them I will never, never allow Guildford to become king. Meanwhile, outside the tower, Princess Mary was raising an army to take the throne by force. A civil war over the crown erupted. Jane was to remain in the tower until Mary was captured. Although she didn't know it at the time, the 15-year-old would never set foot outside the fortress walls again. As Jane passed her days and nights quietly inside the tower, across England, the entire country began to take sides for Mary or Jane. The stakes were high, and the price of failure was death. Jane was now in the eye of the storm. <laughs> At the time, powerful noblemen were able to raise their own militias. Northumberland gathered soldiers and set off to defeat Mary and her supporters. If he failed, he would pay with his life. As the desperate Northumberland battled, back in London his scheme was unravelling. Support for Mary was growing. The council began to doubt their decision making Jane Queen. Jane had become a liability. In a desperate attempt to save themselves, the council switched their support to Mary Tudor as the rightful monarch. They declared Northumberland a traitor and Jane a usurper. Jane's time as queen was up. Word was sent to Jane's father that his daughter must give up the crown, which only 10 days earlier she had tried so hard to refuse. On hearing the news, Jane said to her father, I much more willingly take it off than I put it on. Please, may we go home now? Her father didn't answer. Northumberland was defeated by Mary's army and taken prisoner. Jane's parents fled the tower, leaving their daughter behind. Jane was arrested for treason. She was left in the tower as a prisoner, along with her teenage husband, Guilford. A triumphant Mary Tudor took the throne as Queen of England and began plotting her revenge on everyone who had kept her from power. Jane's father-in-law, Northumberland, paid for his treason with his head. But even Bloody Mary could not believe that Jane Grey was a traitor. The teenager had simply been a pawn in a massive game of power politics. Jane knew that she had to stand trial for treason and be found guilty, but Jane had been given the Queen's word that she and her husband, Guildford, would be pardoned and eventually would be set free. Jane's thoughts were with her husband. If it be your will, Lord, let me be pardoned. But above all, let my husband be spared. Everything might have gone according to plan if Jane's father had not foolishly raised an army to return his daughter to the throne. Jane's father and his army seized the south bank of the River Thames. He demanded the tower, his daughter, and the new Queen Mary be surrendered to him. When Queen Mary refused, Jane's father bombarded the tower with his own daughter in it. He was endangering his daughter's life as well as that of the Queen. The innocent teenager had to die to end the plots against the new queen. Mary signed death warrants for Jane and Guildford. Jane's fate was sealed. She had a chance to see her doomed, beloved husband, Guildford. Unable to face the pain, she refused to meet him. To meet him would weaken our resolve to meet our deaths. We must postpone our meeting until we meet in a better world, where our happiness will be eternal. From her cell, the teenager watched her young husband led to the scaffold. She remained at the window until his headless body was carried back. 
For the first time, she broke down and wept, muttering Guilford's name over and over. <laughs> now it was Jane's turn to face the executioner. A pawn in the struggle for the throne, the innocent teenage girl had to take the long walk that would end in her decapitation. She walked bravely from her cell to the scaffold on Tower Green. As she mounted the steps, Jane remained brave and calm, but her priest and ladies-in-waiting broke down and wept. When Jane knelt down and tied a handkerchief around her eyes, she reached for the block, but it was beyond her reach. For the first time, she panicked. Where is it? Where is it? I don't know what to do. Oh, dear God. Everyone on the platform froze in horror. Finally, someone in the crowd mounted the steps and placed the terrified girl's hands on the block. Calming herself, she laid her head on the block, muttering, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Fifteen-year-old Jane Grey had been queen for only nine days. She was executed on February the 13th, 1558. Though Jane Grey was one of the few in English history who did not want the crown, she died for it anyway. Throughout history, many have fought and died for the right to wear the famous symbol of power. But besides being a symbol, the crown and its jewels are also very precious objects. The actual collection of crowns, scepters, orbs and ceremonial necklaces are kept in a vault deep inside the tower, guarded with tight security. Every day, thousands of tourists inspect the crown jewels. Many visitors often ask how much that collection is worth. The answer is that the crown jewels are worth nothing, for they are priceless. Encrusted with rare gems, the royal crown itself is worn only on state occasions and then returned to its permanent home. It is said, some of the stones that make up the crown jewels exert a strange and mystical power. The Koh-i-Noor diamond, seen here set in the crown of Queen Elizabeth at her coronation, is said to carry a strange curse. The famed stone has been fought over for 2,000 years. In 1739, the Shah of Persia invaded India searching for the Koh-i-Noor diamond, then owned by the Mughal Emperor. Despite a brutal ransacking, the diamond couldn't be found. Eventually, after being tortured, one of the emperor's harem revealed that the emperor hid the diamond in his turban. The Shah invited the emperor to a feast and suggested they cement a peace by exchanging turbans. Retiring to a room, the Shah unwrapped the Emperor's turban and out spilled the priceless stone. He exclaimed, Koh-i-Noor, which means mountain of light in Persian. The huge diamond came to Britain in 1850 during British rule of India. It was presented to Queen Victoria, who had the stone recut and placed in the new crown. But no male member of the royal family has ever worn it, because legend states that men who possess it will suffer misfortune, while women who own the diamond will rule the world. Stealing the crown jewels from the Tower of London remains one of the ultimate criminal challenges. No one's ever done it, but one man came very close. A rogue named Colonel Thomas Blood attempted to steal the jewels and actually came to hold the crown in his hands. But strangely enough, he didn't have to pay the consequences for his audacious crime. 
In early September 1680, a group of men dug up the body of Colonel Thomas Blood in a London graveyard. They wanted to make sure he was really dead. Colonel Thomas Blood had brazenly broken into the Tower of London and actually held the crown in his hands. How he nearly stole the crown jewels and got away with it is one of the greatest riddles in the Tower's history. In 1659, King Charles II took back the throne from rebels after 17 years of civil war. To symbolize his power, the newly throned king ordered that crown jewels be made. But the collection of jewels would soon be the target of a brazen crime. Needing more than jewels to show his power, King Charles purged rebels and their sympathizers. One of the victims of the king's campaign was Colonel Thomas Blood. As a rebel supporter, Colonel Blood's money, house and land were confiscated by the king's agents. He was left a broken man. Bitter, looking for revenge, out to regain his fortune, Colonel Blood planned attacks on the king's supporters. The colonel was prone to outlandish schemes that always seemed to be jinxed. But in lucky twists of fate, he always managed to survive. He organized an attack on Dublin Castle, hoping to take the king's representative prisoner and hold him for ransom. Days before the plot was put into action, the entire affair unraveled. Dozens of conspirators were arrested, tried and executed. But despite a large reward for his capture, the clever Colonel Blood was able to get away. Colonel Blood escaped to England under an assumed name. With several failed schemes behind him, the hapless Colonel Blood was broke and desperate. Finally, he hatched a plot as bizarre as it was elaborate. Colonel Blood proposed to steal King Charles's new crown jewels. Colonel Blood learned that the jewels were kept in the lower dungeon of the jewel house. They were guarded by a retired military officer named Talbot Edwards. Edwards was the master of the jewels and guided visitors who wanted to see the collection. Edwards and his family lived in an apartment above the royal vaults. Launching his scheme, Colonel Blood disguised himself as a reverend and enlisted a female accomplice who pretended to be his wife. Together they visited the tower under the pretext of viewing the crown jewels. Once the pair were at the tower, the gullible Talbot Edwards welcomed them and led them through the vaults to the precious gems. Once inside the jewel vault, Blood's plan began to swing into action. His accomplice faked illness, and when his so-called wife pretended to faint, Blood suggested that she be taken somewhere more comfortable to recover. Playing perfectly into Colonel Blood's scheme, the kindly Edwards insisted the lady be brought to his personal quarters where she could be tended to by his wife. Several days later, Colonel Blood returned with gifts for Mrs. Edwards as repayment for her kindness. And so began a friendship between the two couples. The phony Reverend Blood relentlessly pursued a relationship with the master of the jewels for all it was worth. The families frequently dined together. On one occasion, Colonel Blood brought along a young man he introduced as his nephew. In fact, the nephew was a partner in crime brought in to case the heist job. Colonel Blood told Edwards that the nephew had a friend visiting London who wanted to see the crown jewels. The colonel claimed the friend could not wait until the tower was opened because he had to leave early. In reality, the friend was the third member of the robbery team. Edwards gladly made special arrangements. Everyone should be at the tower just before seven o'clock the next morning. On the night of May the 8th, 1671, Colonel Blood and his accomplices made their final preparations. They each carried a short dagger. Colonel Blood took several pistols and a wooden mallet. Another man carried a file. 
Just before dawn, they set off for the tower. One man guarded the horses, while Colonel Blood and the other two put their plan into action. Nervously, Blood and his men made their way across the open courtyard to the tower itself. Hiding their firearms, Blood led them to the entrance of the jewel tower. The unsuspecting Edwards warmly greeted the men and led them to the vault. The would-be robbers were now within yards of the biggest and most valuable hall in the world. As the massive iron gate swung open, Colonel Blood drew the mallet and bashed Edwards across the head. The master of the jewels fell screaming and struggling. In the scuffle, one of the thieves stabbed Edwards while the others rushed into the vault. Colonel Blood smashed the crown, shoving its crumpled remnants into an old leather bag. Everything was going according to plan. Nothing but an easy escape stood between Colonel Blood and unimaginable riches. But Colonel Blood's jinx struck again. The thieves ran into Edwards's son, who unexpectedly stepped into the middle of the heist. With young Edwards and a tower guard in hot pursuit, the thieves scrambled away and into the winding maze of the tower. Colonel Blood and his accomplices crossed the open courtyard towards the tower drawbridge and freedom beyond. Colonel Blood's outlandish scheme was unravelling as his partners were taken down one by one. Only Colonel Blood remained. Colonel Blood was blocked by yet another warden. In a last-ditch attempt to escape, Colonel Blood drew a pistol. As the gun went off, the warden ducked and wrestled Colonel Blood to the ground. Another of Colonel Blood's outlandish schemes had failed again. He was dragged back into the tower where he would wait in his cell to face a trial for treason. It looked like Colonel Blood's luck for avoiding the law had finally run out. By the end of the day, news of Colonel Blood's astonishing plot and the damage to the crown jewels reached King Charles. But the king had an odd reaction. He was curious rather than outraged about this strange criminal who had more bravery than brains. Four days later, the king confronted the man who almost stole the treasure. No one knows what words passed between the King of England and the common thief. But within days of this strange meeting, Colonel Thomas Blood was released from the tower with a full royal pardon. Even more amazingly, Colonel Blood was granted a lordly pension of £500 a year for life. He had wriggled out of trouble once again. Though Colonel Blood may have amused King Charles, no one else trusted him. Rumours had it that he became a spy for the king, or perhaps a dupe the king, or maybe he was just a charming con man. History will never know the answer. People didn't even trust him when the news of Colonel Blood's death was announced on August the 24th, 1680. It was assumed it was another of the rascal's harebrained schemes that he had faked his own death. To settle the questions, the London coroner ordered the body to be exhumed. Was he really dead? Indeed he was there. The grave was one tight spot even the audacious Colonel Blood could not escape. Through the centuries, those who were trapped in the Tower of London fought to get out. Now instead of fighting to get out, crowds line up to get in. 
and the warders who once led the condemned to execution now conduct guided tours and entertain visitors with stories of brutal beheadings. The walls of the tower have withstood a thousand years of deadly plots, fierce power struggles and attempted invasions. The tower stands as a fearsome symbol of royal might and a reminder of the tragic fate that befell those who attempted to challenge the kingdom. At the heart of England's capital stands the Tower of London, a symbol of power for nearly a thousand years. Through its long history, the tower has been the castle of kings, a fortress, a stronghold of royal treasure, a forbidding prison. Its stones have witnessed mysteries, tortures, executions. These tower walls have tales to tell. Today, the tower is one of the world's most popular tourist spots. The famous guards of the tower, the Beefeaters, guide sightseers through the benign castle. But in the past, reluctant visitors found the fortress full of horrific danger. After the Normans conquered England, they built the Tower of London as their center of rule over the kingdom. Long before Buckingham Palace, the tower was the symbol of royal might. To control the tower, was to control England, and anyone who violated the secure center of power paid a heavy price. The tower exacted brutal revenge for those who challenged its cold walls. But the tower saved its most severe punishment for those who worked in the fortress and dared betray it. This was the case for a naive, love-struck prison guard who ended up gruesomely hung to die from a tower wall. His partners in crime were two thieves who faced death in an ingenious, horrifying execution. Together they were involved in a twisted romantic triangle that started with a bold robbery of the king's gold. In 1531, a shipment of 366 gold crowns belonging to King Henry VIII arrived at the London docks. With a modern value of over one million dollars, it was a virtual king's ransom. But the gold was mysteriously stolen. The brazen robbery of the king's gold launched a massive investigation. Two years later, a shady sailor was arrested and imprisoned in the tower as authorities prepared their case against him. While the sailor languished in the dark confines of the tower, he was often visited by his common-law wife, Alice Tankerville. During Alice's visits, a young prison guard named John Board was smitten with the beautiful and seductive Alice. John Board's infatuation with Alice started innocently enough but in the end, it would cost the naive jailer dearly. The trouble started when Alice's husband was released for lack of evidence. Knowing he had to leave London and hide out, Alice's husband asked Board to look after Alice. Already hopelessly in love with Alice, the prison guard happily agreed. Spending more and more time with Board, Alice began returning the prison guard's affection. Before long, they fell into a passionate love affair. Alice became a familiar face around the tower as she frequently visited Board to consummate heated couplings. But the romance was to have tragic consequences. New evidence surfaced in the theft of the king's gold. Not only had Alice's husband stolen the gold, 
but Alice herself was also clearly guilty in the heist. Alice and her husband were tried in secret. They were convicted and sentenced to be executed. Alice's husband was nowhere to be found, but finding Alice was easy. On one of her visits to her lover, John Board, she was arrested and thrown into a windowless cell in the tower. Board had to endure seeing Alice's harsh imprisonment. Wasting away in a small, dark cell, Alice awaited her execution. Frightened for his Alice, the lovesick John Board schemed an assignment to serve as her guard. Separated by a heavy cell door, the jailer and the prisoner he loved spent long hours together. Seeing no way out, the desperate sweethearts plotted a daring escape. John Board had crossed a dangerous line. He abandoned his duty to the Crown and gave his heart to a criminal, the woman he loved. John Board was attempting the impossible. Even though he was a jailer, the tower was considered to be inescapable. The couple launched a risky plan. Board made a copy of the key to the outer door of Alice's cell block. He also bought a 60 foot long length of rope. Board smuggled the rope to Alice for safekeeping. He also passed her a small stick of wood. She hid the tools of escape in a shadowy corner of her cell. Next, they waited for a moonless night. Within the week, a night came. The two lovers went into action. As Board went off duty, Alice passed him the rope. He passed her the duplicate key. After the head warden made his final routine check and locked the outer door, Alice was ready. Using the stick Board had given her, she pushed the wooden pin out of the latch. In seconds, she was out of the cell. Using the duplicate key, Alice opened the cell block door and stepped into the hallways of the tower. Hiding under a dark cloak, Alice slipped outside and into the darkness of the fortress. Carefully, she worked her way along and into the waiting arms of her lover. Holding their breath, Alice and Board waited for the night watchman to pass on his regular rounds. Alice and Board lowered the rope over the wall and into a small boat anchored in the moat far below. They slid down the rope and into the boat. Then they edged out across the moat under the eyes of the guards. Spring night, they glided silently to the opposite side of the bank. Board had arranged for a pair of horses to be waiting nearby. They would ride to a friend's house. From there, the lovers would make their final dash for freedom. Just within yards of their getaway, they came face to face with the night watch. In a cold sweat, Alice and Board approached the oncoming soldiers. They desperately hoped they could get away with a quick greeting but it was too late. The soldiers challenged them. In seconds, all hope of escape vanished. They would face the vengeance of the tower. Alice was taken to the same miserable cell that had been her home for seven long months. This time, 
the door was securely locked. But something much worse awaited John Board, the jailer who had gone over to the other side. Enraged by the treason of their own jail guard, the authorities had a simple torture for Board. They stuffed him into the notorious cell known as Little Ease. The cell was neither wide enough to lie down in, nor tall enough to stand up in. Board was forced to be in a crouching position day and night. The pain was agonizing. After an extensive manhunt, the authorities caught up with Alice's husband. He was hauled to the tower to await execution. When Alice was reunited with her husband, fate had one more twist in store as the couple ended up spending their last moments together. On March the 31st, 1534, Alice and her sometimes husband faced a hellishly ingenious death for stealing the king's gold. The couple were taken to the bottom of the tower wall at the edge of the River Thames. At low tide, they were chained to the wall, waist deep in the water. Terrified, Alice and her husband watched as the rising tide slowly lifted. They twisted and turned in panic as the water came closer and closer, drowning them slowly. Alice and her husband died horrible deaths, but John Board's fate was worse. There was no limit to the price to be paid for betrayal of a trusted position in the tower. Board was tortured on the rack while other guards cruelly jeered him. The rack's usual purpose was to extract confessions, but in this case, it was cruelly used to inflict horrendous pain. After the rack, Board's muscles were torn. His arms and legs were pulled from their sockets. But the disgraced prison guard's ordeal had just begun. Board was then chained and suspended from a wall of the tower. He hung for days, slowly dying of exposure and starvation. His body was left to rot a gruesome example to anyone foolish enough to defy the awful justice of the tower. Through the centuries, many have tried to breach the tower's security. Only one man ever succeeded in actually invading the Tower of London. He led a murderous mob into the very heart of the kingdom. But the tower got its revenge. The 14th century was a desolate era. Horror and fear paralyzed Britain as the bubonic plague stalked the land. It was known as the Black Death. The disease was fatal in almost all cases. Those infected faced an agonizing death. The disease was carried by rats and passed to humans through fleas. Science and medicine did not exist in the Dark Ages. Ignorance bred panic. Those still healthy shunned the dying. In a misguided attempt to keep the plague from spreading, soldiers sealed up houses and all those inside. Even if just one member of a family fell ill, a black cross was painted on the door and no one was allowed to help. In order to purify the area, the house would be burnt to the ground. Even healthy people trapped inside would be burned alive. Medical solutions to cure the plague were often as bad as the disease itself. The most common remedy was to attach live leeches to the patient to suck poisons out of the blood. If the leeches didn't appear to work, the patient would be bled directly, supposedly to release poisoned blood. Unfortunately, patients often bled to death. Some physicians had a theory the Black Death was caused by demons in the mind. They saw only one way to release the demons. Patients had holes drilled into their head. Surgical instruments were rare, so the tools used by physicians were usually borrowed from a carpenter or a mason. No one was cured and few survived. 
in an atmosphere of panic and superstition. Turning to the church for an explanation of the Black Death brought little comfort. Priests claimed God was punishing men for their sins. In the end, the Black Death killed almost half Britain's population. The survivors faced a living hell. Famines stalked the land as people ate dogs, horses and garbage. Cities were abandoned. It was a time of anarchy. In an era of chaos, even the tower that stood impenetrable to enemies for centuries was breached for the first and only time in its history. An ex-soldier who made his living as a thief and highwayman led a howling mob that successfully stormed the tower and rampaged through the royal household. Only a frail teenage boy stood between the raging mob and the chaotic collapse of the kingdom. The future of England was in his hands. The boy, 14-year-old King Richard II, sat on the throne of England. Because of his youth, the kingdom was run by a royal council. The advisers governed the country on Richard's behalf until he matured. To add to the burden of plague, famine and poverty, many people who worked the land were serfs feudal slaves controlled by the nobles. The council of aloof, rich noblemen had no connection with the common people. When the council insisted on collecting heavy taxes in 1380, the peasants broke into open revolt. Escaping oppression, thousands of starving, homeless peasants wandered England's roads. But in the taverns of London, one man was ready to exploit the peasants' anger. A former soldier and highwayman, Watt Tyler, fueled their anxieties. The disgruntled peasants eagerly listened to him. Tyler emerged as a leader to command the dispossessed mob. News of the angry mob reached the tower. King Richard decided the time had come to put away his childish pursuits. The teenage Richard interrupted his advisers. The boy king wanted to personally talk to the peasants. Over objections from the council, Richard insisted on meeting with Tyler's mob before they reached London. But the meeting was a disaster. The youthful Richard desperately tried to reason with Tyler and his angry men. The teenage king's pleas were drowned out by the raging mob. Yeah, what you doing, I promise you your freedom. Yeah. Oh, hey, taxi. Taxi. Oh, taxi. The unruly crowd began moving towards the king. Beating a hasty retreat, Richard was hustled back to London and the safety of the tower. I have my proof with me. Is that all you can say? Is that all you can say? Pretty much. What are you going to do for us? But what Tyler and the rebels hounded Richard and the royal court back to the city. Reaching London, the mob surged through the narrow streets, pillaging everything in their path. Desperate to save their lives and property, Londoners offered the mob food, beer and wine. But alcohol just fired up the mob. They became uncontrollable. Rioting continued into the night. Hundreds died in an orgy of looting, murder and destruction. Moving from the streets of London, Tyler led the baying mob to the tower. From the parapets of the tower, young Richard watched helplessly as Tyler and the horde surrounded the tower. It looked as if the entire kingdom was about to be plunged into chaos. An angry horde of peasants outnumbered soldiers 50 to 1. The council told Richard to attack the mob. Under immense pressure, the 14-year-old king was maturing into a wise ruler. He vetoed the advice to assault the crowd. Instead, the young king addressed the crowd from the tower roof and offered a solution. If they would leave, he would hear their grievances the next day at a nearby field. Tens of thousands agreed to the meeting. The next morning, 
Richard and the royal party rode out to meet the mob. There was danger in the air as the teenage king confronted Tyler and the peasant mob at the field. The young king agreed to cancel the tax, and he abolished serfdom. From now on, serfs would become tenant farmers, free to choose where they worked. While the young king tirelessly worked to solve the peasants' grievances, Tyler crept back to London, where thousands of his followers still surrounded the tower. Convinced he could seize the royal stronghold and command the city, Tyler whipped his men into a fury. He boasted the mob would rule all of England by the end of the week. Rushing the tower, the mob overwhelmed the guard, seized the outer drawbridge, and stormed the main gate. Tyler had accomplished the impossible. For the first and only time in history, the Tower of London had been breached by an enemy force. They surged through the halls and passageways, destroying everything in their path. Breaking into the King's private quarters, the mob attacked Richard's mother and raped her lady-in-waiting. When they reached the Royal Chapel, the mob found the Archbishop of Canterbury giving communion to the Lord Treasurer and the Royal Physician. They knocked the communion cup from the Archbishop's hand and stabbed all three to death. Unaware of the attack, Richard returned to find the tower in ruins. He didn't know if his mother was alive or dead. Richard had attempted a peaceful end to the crisis, but it seemed doomed to failure. Despite the personal attack on his family, the young king was determined not to fight violence with violence. Taking the future of the kingdom in his hands, risking his own life, Richard arranged a final showdown with Tyler. Accompanied by a bodyguard of armored knights and London's Lord Mayor, the boy king bravely faced Watt Tyler and his unruly mob. Richard was hugely outnumbered. The swaggering Tyler rode up to the king. Tyler recited a list of demands. All nobles except the king were to be abolished. Bishops would be stripped of their power. All church property would be handed over to the rebels to be divided amongst themselves. But Tyler went too far when he demanded the king's great sword of state. Told it was the king's sword and he was not fit to hold it, the enraged Tyler pulled a dagger to attack Richard. Suddenly, the Lord Mayor threw his body in front of Tyler to protect the king. Furious, Tyler plunged his dagger into the Lord Mayor's stomach, but the blade harmlessly glanced off the Mayor's armor. Before Tyler realized what had happened, the Lord Mayor drew his dagger and gored Tyler across the neck. Blood gushing from the wound, Tyler screamed in pain and stumbled to the ground. With their leader dying, the mob surged forward. Ready to fight, they drew swords and loaded arrows. The king's bodyguards prepared for battle. The outnumbered Richard was about to be overrun. But the teenage king calmly rode forward and addressed the mob. Sirs, will you kill your king? I am your rightful leader. If you love me, follow me. With that, Richard turned his horse around away from London. The leaderless peasants quietly gathered up their weapons and followed Richard. They broke up and began to make their way home. 14-year-old Richard had proven he was more a king than a boy. And what Tyler, the only man to lead a successful assault on the tower, was dead. In its greatest moment of danger, the tower had remained in its rightful hands. The assault on the tower had been avenged. The walls of the tower are cold and inanimate. But through the centuries, the fortress seemed to know how to dispense terrible justice.
In the 17th century, the tower made sure justice was done. When a judge who condemned many to an unfair death faced his own miserable end in a tower cell. In 1690, a member of the English Parliament opened his door one morning to find a grim sight. A corpse had been nailed to his door as a warning. The gruesome message came from Judge George Jeffreys. The judge was in charge of administration of justice during the short, turbulent reign of King James II. Take the rabble away! An unpopular king, James was arrogant and held a contempt for the law. The king brooked no criticism of himself or his Catholic faith. To carry out his authoritarian policies, James needed a strong enforcer who didn't mind if the law got in the way. <laughs> Often drunk in court, Jeffreys had a reputation as an abusive jurist who matched the king's disregard for the law. Seeing a kindred spirit, James appointed Judge Jeffreys as a high state official. Next to the king, Jeffreys was the most powerful man in England. Jeffreys reveled in his new power and hijacked the legal system. In a kingdom ruled by law, Jeffreys now became the law himself. He used the legal bench to condemn anyone foolish enough to voice even the mildest complaint about King James or the Catholic Church. He draped the walls of his kangaroo court in blood-red tapestries to terrify anyone brought before him. A mean drunk, Jeffreys had no time for legal niceties. The only accepted plea in his lawless court was guilty. A not guilty plea took up too much time and was likely to get the accused hanged on the spot without even having time to say their prayers before the execution. The English chafed under the autocratic rule of King James and his henchman, Judge Jeffreys. No such plea as not guilty in my court. With every new execution, opposition to King James and Judge Jeffreys grew. The king's enemies grew bolder and searched for someone to replace him. The king's enemies finally turned to King James's nephew, the Duke of Monmouth. As the illegitimate son of the late King Charles, Monmouth had royal blood. He was also a Protestant, which would bring religious peace. Handsome and charming, Monmouth had been a brave and popular army leader by the age of 20. And Monmouth hated his uncle, the king. Driven more by ambition than sense, Monmouth seized the offer to unseat the king. With the help of the king's enemies, Monmouth raised an army to overthrow his uncle. He was ready to ride into the Tower of London in victory. Despite his best efforts to raise support, Monmouth's cause fell apart. The handsome young duke ran for his life. With Monmouth defeated, Judge Jeffreys charged him with high treason, waging war against the king and trying to assume the crown. To make his point, Jeffreys added his own personal postscript. Monmouth, may you rot in hell. <laughs> Two days later, Monmouth was captured. Ignoring legal procedure, Jeffreys ruled Monmouth was not entitled to a trial and immediately sentenced him to a beheading. A crowd of Monmouth's supporters gathered on Tower Hill to watch his grisly end. With solemn dignity, Monmouth walked through the throng and mounted the black draped scaffold. Before kneeling to the block, Monmouth calmly felt the edge of the executioner's axe. He wondered if the blade was sharp enough to sever his neck. As was the morbid custom of the times, Monmouth tipped the executioner six coins to do a quick, clean job. With what followed, the gratuity was undeserved. Unnerved by Monmouth's calm, the executioner missed with the first stroke. The blade only grazed the back of Monmouth's head. The executioner tried again. The crowd screamed and pushed towards the scaffold. 
The hero Monmouth was being butchered like a hog. Frustrated, the executioner tossed his axe aside. Putting an end to the sloppy execution, he pulled a knife and stabbed Monmouth to death. The enraged mob rushed the scaffold, pulling the executioner and several guards to the ground. The scene exploded into chaos as others dipped handkerchiefs in Monmouth's blood to keep as souvenirs of their hero. Where he failed to bring Jeffreys down in life, Monmouth would succeed in death. The botched execution fanned popular discontent. Fearing a general rebellion, King James and Judge Jeffreys quickly and ruthlessly moved to stamp out resistance. Jeffreys' spies rooted out Monmouth's conspirators and supporters. Drinking heavily in court, the judge pursued his brand of justice with renewed zeal. In two months, Judge Jeffreys had over 320 men and women executed. Another 841 people were sent to the West Indies to be sold as slaves. Jeffreys bragged he'd hanged more men than all his predecessors since the Norman Conquest. Judge Jeffreys' lawless rampage was out of control. Members of the House of Lords finally objected to his brutality. A law unto himself, Jeffreys answered the legislators by nailing corpses to their front doors. Supporting Jeffreys, King James suspended the legal system and disbanded Parliament. Public outrage at King James and Judge Jeffreys now reached a breaking point. There was only one way to end the mayhem. With nowhere to turn, Parliament reached out to a foreign power to help overthrow the tyrants. In desperation, Parliament urged the Protestant King of Holland to invade England and claim the throne for himself. James fled his capital after barely three years on the throne. With his protector gone, the tyrannical Judge Jeffreys ran for his life. Disguised as a sailor, he snuck off to the London docks. He bought passage to France on a coal barge. He was about to avoid true justice. But while Jeffreys waited for the boat to sail, he wanted one more drink. He crept ashore and went to a dockside tavern named the Red Crow. It would prove to be a costly drink. As Jeffreys drank, he was recognized by a clerk. Jeffreys had once sentenced the man to a whipping. The judge was exposed. He huddled in a corner, desperately ducking drinks, food and insults hurled by the rabid crowd. Authorities were summoned to save Jeffreys from the mob and haul him away. Ironically, the terrified Jeffreys begged to be taken to the safest place in the city, the Tower of London. But even the thick walls of the tower could not protect Jeffreys from public hatred. Jeffreys' victims were let into the tower to stare at their judge through his cell bars. Caged like an animal, Jeffreys had to endure the abuse hurled at him. Knowing he was a drunk, Parliament instructed the guards at the tower to provide Jeffreys with all the brandy he could pay for. It turned out to be a suitable punishment. Four months later, abandoned and alone, Judge Jeffreys literally drank himself to death. London always seemed to visit revenge on those who worked within its walls and abused their power. No one had more control over the tower than the man who kept the keys to the fortress. And when he turned traitor, the tower unleashed its terrible vengeance once again. In 1147, a man with an arrow in his skull lay on a field writhing in agony. 
It was the price he was paying for treachery and lust for power. The man was Geoffrey de Mandeville, the tower's constable and the sheriff of London. The tower constable was one of the kingdom's most respected officers, for he held the keys to the castle. Control of the tower was crucial in the 12th century. With England under the harsh but shaky rule of the Norman kings, holding the central military position in London meant control of all England. But chaos descended on the tower when King Henry I died and left no heir to take the throne. As the king's daughter, Matilda was the obvious choice to succeed to the throne. Hard and cynical, she was suited for the job. But a woman had never served as a monarch of England. Another candidate with royal blood was Matilda's enemy and cousin, Count Stephen of Blois. Stephen was the dead king's favorite nephew. He was friendly, attractive, and good-natured. But many considered him too soft to be king. Which cousin would rule over England? Into the confusion stepped Mandeville. An opportunist, he saw his crucial position of the Tower Guardian as a way to gain power. When Stephen made the first move and grabbed the contested throne by taking over the tower, Mandeville was at the gate to meet him. Eager to ingratiate himself with the new king, Mandeville presented Stephen with the keys to the fortress. Then Mandeville started a shameless campaign to curry favor from the king. Stephen also needed toadies like Mandeville. With his cousin Matilda eyeing the throne, the new king was on shaky ground. To keep Mandeville and other noblemen on his side, Stephen gave them land, castles, and estates. Mandeville and the other noblemen were willing to sell their loyalty to the highest bidder. They played Stephen off against his cousin Matilda in the battle for the throne. As the barons gained one concession after another, Stephen began to lose control. Meanwhile, Matilda made her move. She made lavish offers of land and money to any nobleman who would help her overthrow her cousin Stephen. Mandeville was the first in line. The war between the cousins, King Stephen and Matilda, for the throne of England was about to begin. The treacherous Mandeville, who had supported King Stephen, switched sides. He was waiting on the beach to welcome Matilda when she landed in England to begin the battle over the crown. Soon, England tore itself apart in bloody civil war. Towns, villages and farms were burnt and looted by one side, then the other. Many starved to death in the famine that followed, their bodies left in heaps. As the powerful battled, the poor suffered sorrow, misery, and oppression. After Stephen was captured, his cousin Matilda's army fought on. Behaving like the cynical politician he was, Mandeville greeted Matilda when she marched into London. He greeted her as warmly as he'd greeted her cousin Stephen only six years earlier. Mandeville eagerly offered her the keys to the Tower of London. Now that Matilda controlled the tower and most of the country, it wasn't long before the war-weary English had reason to hate her. How dare you come to me with these pathetic excuses? She imposed crushing taxes on the impoverished country and ordered troops to ruthlessly put down any sign of insurrection. 
for failing to pay Matilda's taxes, three villagers from Suffolk were impaled on wooden spikes. As an object lesson to the population, they suffered in full view of everyone on the main road. There, they agonizingly died of exposure and loss of blood. Even Mandeville was shocked by Matilda's behavior. As Matilda planned her coronation, her support crumbled away. The calculating Matilda had also made another grave mistake. She left her cousin Stephen alive, albeit as a prisoner in the tower. Once again, Mandeville had to work out which way to jump and which side to support. Stephen's army reached London and townspeople broke into open revolt against the tyrannical Matilda. As the gates of the city were thrown open to Stephen's army, Matilda and Mandeville slipped out in the confusion, fleeing for their lives. Many of the noblemen who had supported Matilda switched sides back again to King Stephen. Mandeville wasn't so lucky. With the country in chaos, Mandeville was captured by Stephen and stripped of his land and titles and arrested for treason. After holding the keys to the tower, he was now kept in one of the tower cells. But once again, Mandeville was able to play both sides against the middle. Well, well. Mandeville begged King Stephen's forgiveness. He surrendered his castles to the king and gave his word of honor never to plot against him again. Needing Mandeville's support, Stephen forgave him and released him from prison. My liege, I can my liege. You betray me again. Not anywhere to stay. Nowhere to hide. No roof, no shelter. Not in this country or anywhere in Europe. I'll hunt you down. All right. Stripped of his power, title, and wealth, Mandeville had nothing to lose. Now go. Get out of my sight. Go now. Be gone. Get out. To get it all back, Mandeville launched a vicious war against Stephen. At the head of his personal army, Mandeville attacked the king's castles and land. He cut a swathe of devastation, destroying towns and villages loyal to the king. He burned houses, seized crops and farm animals, robbed churches. Anyone who got in his way was slaughtered. Villagers were expected to pay taxes to keep his personal army in the field. If they refused, Retribution was immediate. Wives were widowed and children were orphaned as his cruelty ran unchecked. Pursuing his guerrilla war, Mandeville moved against one of Stephen's castles. As the army approached the fortress, Mandeville rode ahead to survey the defences. Then he removed his helmet for a better look. A crossbowman on the castle wall took careful aim and fired an arrow straight into Mandeville's head. With the arrow buried deep in his skull, Mandeville lived in agony for almost a week. Finally, the scheming opportunist died with nothing to show for his efforts. Like so many before and after him, Mandeville realized the tower leveled its own special vengeance. To challenge the tower was often foolhardy, but to fail was fatal. Across the centuries, the tower has been the symbol of royal power. 
Its stones have guarded one of the largest empires in history. But such immense power exacts its price. Those who could not rise the challenge of gaining and holding power had their spirits and bodies crushed within the tower walls. At the heart of England's capital stands the Tower of London, a symbol of power for nearly a thousand years. Throughout its history, the tower has been the castle of kings, a fortress, a stronghold for royal treasure. It has been the site of intrigues and mysteries, of tortures and executions. The tower walls have many stories to tell. In the 16th century, kings and queens moved out of the tower. The fortress became a grim prison for the most dangerous enemies of the kingdom. Rebels, rivals for the crown, and spies. Few left alive. Most were condemned to face the executioner. In the name of the state, barbaric slayings were carried out beneath the shadow of the tower. Common criminals were hanged, but these were not quick kills. Instead of dropping from a height sufficient to instantly break their neck, criminals were hauled into the air. The rope tightened slowly, causing the victim's tongue to swell and turn purple. Their eyes popped from their skulls. The condemned twisted and kicked as they slowly choked to death. Despite the horror of hanging, Beheading was not that much better. Beheading was considered a privilege, an honourable form of execution reserved for nobles and gentlemen. As if having a head chopped off in a pulpy, bloody mess was not enough, the victim also took part in a gruesome and humiliating custom. The condemned was expected to give the executioner a tip to convince him to do a quick, tidy job. Despite the gratuity, records show that three, four, even five strokes were not uncommon before the head was finally removed from the body. How long the victim was conscious during the ordeal was not known. The executioner's axe was a heavy, cumbersome weapon. It often produced a blow more like a meat cleaver than a surgical instrument. After the beheading, the executioner held the head up to the roaring crowd. The head was then stuck on a pole and taken to London Bridge. The heads were put up for the public to see as an advertisement to warn royal subjects about the price of treason. The heads were coated in tar so they would last longer. But eventually the birds picked at the flesh and eyes. Meanwhile, the headless bodies were wheeled into the tower grounds and buried without markers. The most grisly of all execution methods was live disemboweling. The barbaric practice was so heinous and gross that Queen Elizabeth finally banned the practice. The last time it was used was in 1586. The last disembowelment execution was the work of Francis Walsingham, the man known as the father of modern spy methods. A master of injury, Walsingham was known as the Spy Master. The reign of Elizabeth I was the great age of the spy. It was a time when information was all important and ignorance could mean death. When Queen Elizabeth established the Protestant Church in England, the Vatican ordered any Catholic in Europe to assassinate her. The Queen was in grave danger. It was the Queen's job to protect the Kingdom. But who would protect the Queen? Elizabeth's personal safety became Walsingham's lifelong obsession. Walsingham ran his web of intrigue from the Tower. He was a brilliant, ruthless politician who studied every spy network in Europe. He put together the world's first counter-espionage agency and planted spies across England as his eyes and ears. 
Their sole purpose was to uncover plots against Elizabeth. As a cunning spy, Walsingham knew that in the tower's dark corridors, a whisper in the wrong place or to the wrong person could mean a horrible death. Protestant Elizabeth feared the return of Catholic rule led by her cousin Mary Stuart, Queen of Scotland. In a time of shifting allegiances, Mary had to flee Scotland to escape repeated attempts to overthrow her. Mary had no way out and begged her cousin Elizabeth for sanctuary. But the sanctuary turned out to be captivity. When Mary entered England, she was arrested on suspicion of plotting against the crown. Mary was kept under house arrest and moved from place to place to keep her out of touch with her Catholic supporters. Despite Mary's arrest, Walsingham wasn't satisfied. He couldn't rest knowing that Elizabeth's greatest enemy still posed a threat to her reign. Walsingham was obsessed with finding a way of getting rid of Mary. He had a simple solution. Somehow, Mary must be executed. But try as he might, Walsingham could not convince the Queen to kill her own cousin. Elizabeth refused to sanction the execution of another monarch. Regicide was a serious precedent. Killing a royal might come back and haunt Elizabeth if she were ever the target of a plot. But the perfect opportunity to get Mary fell into Walsingham's hands. The spymaster uncovered a scheme against Elizabeth, a plot that seemed to lead directly to the imprisoned Scottish Queen. According to intercepted letters, the plan had been hatched by a Catholic partisan, Anthony Babington. He was a rich young man who adored Queen Mary. What Babington didn't know would end up killing him. Two of his trusted co-conspirators were actually Walsingham's agents. Nothing Babington did remain secret. Walsingham learned the plotters were smuggling letters back and forth to Mary, but some of the letters were in code. Working day and night, it didn't take long for Walsingham's code breakers to crack the cipher. In his own hand, Babington wrote that he and ten followers would free Mary from her internment, put her on the throne, and re-establish Catholicism in England. In addition, he planned to murder Queen Elizabeth. But the conspirators wanted Mary's approval before moving ahead. The letters were enough to have Babington and his men executed as traitors. And if Mary agreed to the plot, Walsingham would have enough proof to have her head as well. Walsingham let the intercepted letter continue on to Mary. When Mary read the letter, she had two choices. She could tell her cousin Elizabeth about the scheme, or she could go along with the plot to free her. Mary decided to side with Babington. The decision would cost her her life. As Walsingham waited to read Mary's reply, he closed the net around Babington and his men. When word came the plotters were meeting again, England's spymaster struck. Soldiers swept in arresting Babington and his conspirators. Cut off and under guard, Mary was not aware of Babington's arrest. Mary sent her reply just as the men were being hauled into the tower. Anxious to escape her captivity, Mary even suggested a plan. She wrote to Babington, 50 men, well horsed and armed, should come to take me, as my keeper has with him but 18 or 20 horsemen. She ended with, let the great plot go ahead. Mary was clearly involved with the traitors, but Mary never specifically endorsed her cousin Elizabeth's murder. If he was going to convince Elizabeth to execute Mary, Walsingham needed irrefutable proof of her involvement. He decided to take matters into his own hands. 
Driven by his personal war against Mary, Walsingham operated like a professional spy and dropped all pretense of morality. He manufactured evidence. Walsingham forged a postscript to the letter, making it appear Mary had agreed to the murder as she was finishing the letter. Now, Walsingham could go to the Queen and ask for Mary's execution. When Elizabeth read Mary's letter, she was furious. She felt she had done everything possible to protect her scheming cousin, but the forged letter convinced her. Elizabeth could no longer avoid the problem. Walsingham would have his way. Mary would die. Meanwhile, Babington and his cohorts were convicted of treason and sentenced to death. In accordance with tradition, the Queen signed an order of execution which also prescribed the manner of execution. For a spy, there was no punishment heinous enough. On September the 26th, 1586, the horror began. Babington and six of his companions were taken from the tower and brought to the executioner. One after another, they were hanged, but only until they were unconscious. Then they were cut down and revived. As the dazed victims watched in horror, they were disemboweled. Their intestines were thrown into a fire. The victims were kept alive long enough to watch the whole grisly spectacle. As their life bled away, the victims' bodies were hacked into quarters like chunks of beef. As each execution proceeded, the cruelty reached new heights. The remaining conspirators were forced to watch with horror as their friends were being butchered. They had a graphic preview of what was awaiting them. outcry arose at the barbaric disembowelments and it led Elizabeth to order the remaining conspirators to be simply hanged. There was never to be another public dismemberment in England. Now it was Mary's turn. Mary was Queen of Scotland and no court had ever tried the leader of another country. At first, Mary refused to attend the proceedings, insisting no English court had jurisdiction over her. Finally, she admitted her part in the escape plan, but denied any part in the assassination scheme. It was too late. Her cousin, Queen Elizabeth, no longer believed her. On February the 8th, 1587, Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed. The great plot against the Crown of England had been foiled. The great spymaster Walsingham had won the deadly game of cat and mouse. Walsingham was the father of modern spycraft. His ends justified the means at whatever the cost. A professional spy, Walsingham had a number of weapons in his armory. Codes, disappearing inks, even murder. <laughs> In the 17th century, as today, information was power. The importance of secrecy meant that ingenious means were used to keep messages secret. The first codes were simple numerical ciphers with numbers substituted for letters. 
Other codes included puncturing the pages of a book with a pin, the pinholes indicating letters that could be strung together to form messages. Disappearing ink was used by spies. Writing with orange or lemon juice, the secret message disappeared as it dried. To read it, the page would be heated over a candle flame and the message would reappear. This disappearing ink was still being used 300 years later. One of the most ingenious and simple medieval spy codes was made by wrapping a strip of cloth or parchment around a cylinder, often something like a rolling pin or broom handle. The message was then written on the cylinder and unwrapped. Even if intercepted, the message looked like nothing more than a string of random letters. And even if you knew the method, you needed the same cylinder to get the letters back to where they should be. Walsingham was obsessed with codes, but the great spy master also recruited the brightest minds in the country to be part of his spy network. Christopher Marlowe, the great poet and playwright, also had a secret life as one of Walsingham's spies. His secret clandestine activities cut short his legacy as a writer, who could have been as famous as one of his friends, William Shakespeare. But Marlowe had unsavoury friends and strange habits. On May the 30th, 1593, he went on a drinking spree with three other spies, two of whom had been implicated in the Babington plot. No one knows what happened that night, but before it was over, the 29-year-old Marlowe had his throat slashed and bled to death. Some say Marlowe knew too much and was assassinated. Others say it was an argument over a lover. Still others claim it was merely an argument over a bar bill. No arrests for his murder were ever made. His death remains one of history's great mysteries. Now his statue stands in Canterbury outside the theatre that bears his name. But Marlowe the spy and great playwright carried the secret of his murder to the grave. After nine centuries as Britain's most notorious fortress and prison, the tower now plays a far friendlier role. Today, its only captives are millions of tourists who come to see the magnificent crown jewels and thrill to lurid tales of historical mayhem gleefully related by the tower warders. But the Beefeaters were shocked one day in 1991. After a tour of the ancient blood-soaked alleys of the tower, a middle-aged woman stepped out of the crowd. She approached the guide and asked quietly, can you show me the place where they shot my father? The woman's question revealed the tragic story of her father, the last man to be executed in the tower. Her father was Joseph Jacobs, a German spy who was supposed to help guide enemy planes over England during World War II. To ensure the skies were clear enough for Nazi planes to find their targets, the German Air Force needed constant updates on the unpredictable English weather. The only way to obtain this information was to have it transmitted out of England by German spies. Spying is dangerous work, and most spies are highly trained professionals. But Joseph Jacobs was a poorly trained amateur, a pawn in the deadly, ruthless game of wartime intelligence. Jacobs was a dentist and had already served in the German military in the First World War. But at the age of 42, he was again drafted into the German army. In a bureaucratic blunder, Jacobs was ordered into the German secret service. He was given three weeks training in radio communication and meteorology, but he received no special training as an espionage agent. Jacobs was considered expendable. Jacobs was supplied with a radio transmitter hidden in a briefcase, road maps of Great Britain, a set of false identity papers and a pistol. With these simple tools, the dentist would be airdropped into England to establish a clandestine weather service. In the heart of enemy territory, the amateur spy was to radio regular reports to Nazi headquarters. Slipping into British airspace under the cover of darkness, Jacobs parachuted into Huntington, England in January. Not only was Jacobs not a spy, but the dentist had little experience as a paratrooper.
he landed in a farmer's field and shattered his ankle. A painful and immobilizing injury, it would prove to be his fateful Achilles heel and his undoing as a novice spy. He tried to escape and painfully hobbled to the nearest outbuildings. Hungry and tormented by his injury, Jacob surprised the farmer's wife. Terrified, she tried to raise an alarm. Trying to silence her, Jacobs pulled his pistol and limped after her. Hungry, in terrible pain, exhausted, Jacobs dragged himself back to his landing site. He fired his pistol to attract help. A farmer working nearby heard the shots and discovered the unlikely sight of a parachute spread across the middle of his field. When he went to investigate, the farmer found Jacobs lying unconscious beside it. Taken into custody by local police and army reservists, Jacobs denied that he was working for the Germans. Did he think they would take pity on him? Did he think his cover story would work? History never recorded his thoughts, but we know that he had been caught red-handed. He had a Luger pistol, radio transmitter, forged identity papers, and a map showing the location of two nearby airfields. By now, Jacob's injury was so bad that the reservists had to put him on a stretcher before driving Jacobs to London to await his fate. After his ankle was set, Jacobs was transported under military guard to a maximum security London prison for captured spies and saboteurs. The hapless dentist appeared before a military court to be tried under strict wartime secrecy. During the trial, Jacobs claimed he was actually a native of Luxembourg and helped Jews escape from Germany. He said he was sent to a concentration camp because of his anti-Nazi activities. Jacob said he only offered to become a spy so he could get out of Germany and join the anti-Nazi underground. But the claim to be escaping from Nazi Germany was a cover story used by all German spies. And an investigation showed Jacobs charged huge fees to help Jews escape Germany. His military service in the First World War proved he was German, not a citizen of Luxembourg. Swiss police records indicated he had been imprisoned in 1924 for selling counterfeit gold. Joseph Jacobs was convicted as a spy and saboteur and was sentenced to death. During the Second World War, spies were normally hanged in the prison where they were held. But Jacobs couldn't stand at the hangman's gallows because of his shattered ankle. The dentist would have to be shot by a firing squad. The agony of the incompetent spy was further prolonged when the arrangements for his execution had to be changed. 
Jacob's prison did not have a military firing squad. The crippled prisoner had to be transported to the Tower of London, where soldiers on active duty could do the job. So the condemned German spy was moved to the ancient cells of the fortress to meet his fateful appointment with history. At seven o'clock in the morning, on August the 15th, 1941, a truck carrying the crippled dentist spy wound through the tower's maze of alleyways. The truck stopped at an indoor rifle range on the outskirts of the tower's properties. As Jacobs was carried out, a guard pinned a small black target over his heart. Piles of hay were stacked against the back wall to catch the bullets. In front of the hay was a wooden chair. Jacobs was tied to the chair. An officer removed Jacobs' glasses and covered his head with a black hood. The firing squad, six members of the Scots Guards, filed quietly across the entrance of the rifle range. Each soldier carried a Springfield rifle. In the tradition of firing squads, one rifle was loaded with a blank cartridge. This gave comfort to each rifleman on the squad that there was a chance he had not fired a fatal shot. At 7.12 a.m., August the 15th, 1941, the order of fire was given and Joseph Jacobs was executed. The German dentist that became a spy entered the history books as the Tower of London's last victim. Like some implement of medieval torture, the bullet-riddled chair in which Joseph Jacobs met his fate still survives. Kept as an historical artifact, the chair remains safely in storage. It will stay hidden until it no longer haunts the descendants of Joseph Jacobs, the last victim in the long and tragic history of the tower. Unlike the deadly justice meted out by the tower for most spies, one clandestine agent who was a rebel and a traitor ended up being the toast of London. He was also the only American ever held in the tower. Most spies wasted away in the tower's dank cells waiting for execution. But one spy, the only American ever to be imprisoned in the fortress, lived the high life in prison. He carried on a romantic affair and became a London celebrity. 1780. The War of Independence was in full fury. Henry Lawrence, a former president of the American Continental Congress, was on a secret and deadly mission. The journey was soon to end in disaster. Lawrence's boat dodged the British Navy on the way to Europe. His secret mission was to get aid for the American forces battling against Britain. But fate was to give him another place in history. Clinging to the North American coast as long as possible, Lawrence's tiny ship emerged from the protection of a fog bank to confront a massive British man of war bearing down on it. British forces clambered aboard the ship. Before they could grab Lawrence, he threw his secret diplomatic pouch overboard. But a sharp-eyed English sailor spotted the oilskin pouch floating on the water. The contents of the pouch spelled out Lawrence's mission in detail. He was headed to Holland to cement a treaty to support the colony in its war against the British. That was all the evidence the British needed. Henry Lawrence was arrested as a spy and a traitor. Aware of their captives' political importance, the British government did not subject Lawrence to a public trial. But he was interrogated for weeks on end Insisting he was an ambassador and entitled to diplomatic immunity, Lawrence refused to answer questions. But the contents of his diplomatic pouch revealed everything. 
Lawrence was negotiating with a foreign power, an act punishable by death. Henry Lawrence was convicted of high treason and left in a cell in the Tower of London. As added humiliation, Lawrence had to pay rent for his cell and find his own food, drink, bedding, coal and candles. He even had to pay his guards' wages. The cause of American independence attracted the admiring attention of many rebellious young Londoners. Elizabeth Vernon, the teenage daughter of the Tower Jailer, was excited to befriend the middle-aged American rebel, Henry Lawrence. The meeting would change Lawrence's life. Elizabeth sympathised with Lawrence's work for American freedom. She arranged contact for him with London newspapers that supported the American revolutionaries. From his cell, Lawrence wrote a series of articles and letters furthering America's war effort. He needed a way to keep the letters from being destroyed by prison guards. Elizabeth aided Lawrence by hiding the papers in her underwear and smuggling them out of the tower past the suspicious eyes of her prison guard father. Swept up in the thrill of clandestine meetings and hushed conversations, the teenaged Elizabeth and the middle-aged revolutionary became involved in a passionate romance. Word spread through London about the famous colonial rebel being held prisoner in the tower. American independence was a trendy cause among the London glitterati. The eccentric Lawrence became a celebrity and the toast of the town. A parade of London's fashionable society flocked to the tower to visit Lawrence. They brought him wine, brandy and news about the war in America. Probably his most unusual visitor was the notorious Selina, Countess of Huntingdon, and her flamboyant lover, the Lady Anne Erskine. Fifteen months after Henry Lawrence first entered the dark confines of the tower, the British surrendered to George Washington. America had won the war and a new nation was born. Henry Lawrence was released on parole. As he prepared to return to the newly independent United States, Lawrence received an urgent letter from Benjamin Franklin. He was ordered to join Franklin in Paris to negotiate the peace treaty between America and England. From being a traitor, imprisoned in the Tower of London, Lawrence was now dictating the terms of victory to the defeated country that had just recently jailed him. The peace treaty was signed, but fate intervened again to keep Lawrence in Britain. He was appointed the first American ambassador to London. The former secret agent and traitor was now welcomed at the royal court. Jokingly known as Tower Lawrence, the new ambassador spent 18 months in London. He frequently visited his former prison at the Tower to see his love, Elizabeth. When Lawrence returned to America in 1786, he left his beloved Elizabeth behind and rejoined his wife and children. But he never forgot his jail romance. When Lawrence died, six years later, he left Elizabeth a substantial legacy, proof he remembered her love and the extraordinary courage of a young woman who helped a convicted rebel fight for his country. A traitor like Henry Lawrence was too important for the Crown to execute. But in another case of high rank, the privilege of a British diplomat and nobleman was not enough to save him from the hangman's noose at the Tower of London. Sir Roger Casement was a man who led three lives. A respected diplomat who earned a knighthood, he became a spy and traitor to England. But his double life hid a deeper and more secret third life. A sex scandal that led to tragic disgrace and death. 
Casement was a consul with over 20 years' service in the British Foreign Office. With a flawless record and staunch morality, Casement had been selected to investigate reports of human rights abuses in the Belgian Congo and Peru. One of the most respected members of the Foreign Service, he was given the rare honour of a knighthood. In the end, he would become the first person in 300 years to be stripped of the title. As a native of Ireland, Casement was concerned with the welfare of Irish people. When he retired as a British diplomat, he devoted himself to the Irish cause. In the early 1900s, Britain was considering Irish home rule. Turmoil and violence shook Ireland. Distracted by the eruption of World War I in 1914, Britain delayed settling the Irish problem. But in Ireland, the struggle continued. While thousands of men volunteered for the British armed forces, their country tore itself apart with strikes and riots. Loyalties were divided between duty to king and country and desire for political freedom. Casement stepped into the volatile and dangerous situation to support the Irish. In a bold and foolhardy move, Casement decided that Ireland should use the World War as an opportunity to break away from Great Britain. He went as far as calling for Ireland to seek German support in its bid for independence. The British saw it as a traitorous stab in the back. Casement went to the United States to raise money to help drive the British out of Ireland. When war in Europe broke out, Casement met with the German military attaché in Washington. Arrangements were made for Casement to travel to Germany to meet with high-ranking military officials. In Germany, Casement laid out plans for an Irish-German alliance against the British. He asked for 200,000 rifles for the rebel army and an invasion force of 50,000 German troops to back the revolution. The Germans were happy to foment an Irish revolution in Britain's backyard hoping to weaken them and draw British forces away from the battlefields of France. The Germans allowed Casement to visit prisoner of war camps and recruit a fighting unit from the thousands of Irish prisoners. But Casement's scheme found no support. Even the Irish, who wanted a free island, had no intention of helping the hated Germans win the war. After 10 months, Casement had only 55 volunteers. The Germans finally agreed to supply the Irish rebels with 20,000 obsolete rifles and one million rounds of ammunition. The plans were made. A freighter would carry the arms to Ireland by steamer. Casement would be taken by submarine to meet it. Revolutionaries in Ireland would start the uprising against British rule with a surprise attack on Easter Sunday. Roger Casement knew his revolution was doomed. The Irish could never hope to win independence without outside help. He had to get word to his comrades to stop the uprising plan for Easter Sunday, now less than two weeks away. Casement was desperate to stop the bloodbath that would surely happen. Time was running out. Good Friday, 1916. A German U-boat deposited the spy, Roger Casement, off the Irish coast. He had two days to stop the planned Irish uprising that he knew would end in disaster. And he was also waiting for a shipment of arms to the Irish rebels. But a fateful turn of events would tragically unravel Casement's grand plan for Irish independence. Unknown to Casement, the freighter carrying the arms had been intercepted. British intelligence was aware of the entire plot. Six hours later, local police found Sir Roger Casement huddled against the cold April drizzle. Because of the war and political unrest, he was subjected to a routine search. Casement turned out to be a sloppy spy. He was carrying a ticket stub for a German train, the name of the ship delivering the weapons, and a cargo manifest for 20,000 rifles. He was arrested and charged with treason. Easter morning, 1916, dawned to find Casement locked in the tower and Ireland in a state of siege. 
a thousand rebels stormed Dublin's courts and main post office. The government declared martial law. The British military moved in. In the ensuing battles, 200 civilians and 130 British soldiers and police were killed. Sir Roger Casement, the honoured civil servant, was now the most hated man in Britain. When questioned by Scotland Yard, Casement denied he was a traitor. He declared that loyalty is a sentiment, not a law. In his mind, having no sentiment for Britain, his actions could not be criminal. What came next was a twist that stunned everyone. Sir Roger Casement's other hidden life was uncovered. It was the shocking secret of his sex habit. Police uncovered what were to be called the Black Books, hidden in Casement's London flat. In these diaries, they expected to find a record of espionage activity. But instead, they were astonished to find graphic accounts of a secret life filled with hired boys and an insatiable appetite for casual sex with men, particularly black men. In the conservative morality of the time, the revelations were so abnormal they were considered a mental disease. Shocked at the Black Book's disclosure about the real Roger Casement, the government offered the diaries to Casement's defence lawyers. The evidence of espionage left no doubt of the verdict, but the diaries might allow a plea of insanity. It would be humiliating but it could save Sir Roger from being executed for treason. Incredibly, Casement refused the offer. Somehow the seriousness of his situation never seemed to dawn on Roger Casement. Standing in the dock, he appeared unaffected by the guilty verdict or the death sentence. Roger Casement. You will be taken to a place of execution where you will be hanged by the neck until dead. May God have mercy on your soul. The condemned man steadfastly insisted that the British government would not dare hang him. He was wrong. The day after his conviction, Roger Casement was stripped of his knighthood the first such instance in nearly 300 years. Unaware of Casement's sex life, the public which admired his human rights record rose in opposition to his execution. The British government feared the backlash of support would make him a martyr to the Irish cause if he was hanged. To defuse Casement's support, the government leaked word of the secret diaries. No one would help Casement if they knew about his sex life. Excerpts from the black books were circulated among Casement supporters. Select newspaper editors were also let in on the dirty little secret. The Prime Minister, the American Ambassador, the Archbishop of Canterbury and even the head of the Irish rebels were given copies of the diaries. Within days, Casement's support withered away. Old friends disappeared, and his Irish supporters turned on him. On August the 3rd, 1916, the most famous conspirator of the disastrous Irish Easter uprising walked to the gallows. The priest who accompanied him later said, Roger Casement ended his life with the dignity of a prince. Again, the fortress walls stood as witness to centuries of cruelty and torture, deadly intrigue and conspiracy. The stones have stood for a thousand years, but if you listen carefully, 
you can hear the echoes of stories of heroes and villains, of men's folly and human wisdom. Tales from the Tower of London.